right, I'm going to start by uh, thanking Diva for joining us and sharing with us everything that she knows about X-Men. So um, just a little bio uh, for those of you that don't know Diva. Access, uh, Diva is an Access Consciousness facilitator and international speaker. She grew up in London, England, in an environment where several labels of developmental and mental disabilities were part of her everyday life. She developed an ease in dealing with the symptoms and behaviors of people that have been labeled. She has always had the capacity not only to connect with people that have disabilities, but to see the person behind the disability and facilitate change from that unique space. A year in France, working as an English teacher in a secondary school and a college gave her a huge insight into the way that kids of all ages are taught and how even within a controlled environment, it's possible to empower kids on an individual basis. When she came across the Tools of Access Consciousness, she instantly recognized that what it offers is what she'd been looking for, pragmatic tools that work that empower you to know and create the change that's truly possible in the world. Prior to this, for many years, Diva traveled the world working a meeting with heads of state, ministers in government, and blue chip CEOs in Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America in her career in business and economic media, and later business intelligence. However, despite what looked like success on the outside, there was always a sense of stress, failure, not being good enough, and exhaustion that she could not seem to shake. She noticed this in her peers and work environment too, and could not understand why a large number of people with whom she met and worked, who had what seemed like the ideal life, were also for the most part unhappy. This fueled her search for a way to have as full a life as possible, one that included happiness, ease, creativity, business, money, and anything else that was joyful and contributive, contributed both to her and the world. She continues to travel the world by, while working with Access Consciousness and facilitating classes and workshops on what she practices daily in life and business. All I can say is, wow, Diva. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a resume. <laughs> so um, for the people that ne have never heard the term X-Men, can you describe what that means, X-Men? And we titled this X-Men Disability or Ability. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, if you have seen the X-Men movies or if you know of the Marvel comics, then you'll know that X-Men are these amazing superheroes that have all these superpowers um, that are wonderful abilities, but they have to hide from the world, or at least they feel that they do. And they feel like they're freaks and they're weird and they don't really know what to do with their abilities. So sometimes their abilities control them rather than them actually having control. Um, and so we at Access Consciousness, we affectionately call these people and these kids and adults who've been labeled or perhaps not even labeled, we call them X-Men as well because um, we do see that there is an ability behind all of these so-called disabilities and that's what we aim to bring out and empower in each of these individuals. Well, and, and I'm wondering what drew you to uh, learning more about this and giving other people more information about X-Men. Yeah, I mean, um, when I came across Access um, and met the founder, Gary Douglas, I remember being in a class with him and, and he was talking about the X-Men and, you know, how they receive information in such a different way, how they perceive the world very differently, how they function from um, not a linear construct, but more from you know, perhaps extrapolation or chaos. So, you know, their minds are just a very different place. And as he spoke, I started to recognize myself so much in this that I was like, no way, this is unbelievable. And so many of the areas that I had thought that I was wrong started to unravel when I realized that actually these were amazing capacities that I just had no idea what they were, didn't really know how to deal with them or that I could do anything to use them um, to actually create what I would like in my life. So um, the more he spoke, the more I just 
would ask him questions in class. I'd call him on the phone. I was probably a bit of a stalker, like everything. I was asking him, like, how does this relate to X-Men? And tell me more. And what about this? You know, and so, so many of the things that I grew up with as well in my home um, that had been, you know, perhaps difficult to deal with started to come together in a different way um, as I began to look at it from a different perspective which is, you know, like access consciousness, no judgment and actually looking to see what is really going on behind it. So, yeah, that was the beginning. (laughs) I think for me, too, that was such a draw when I first found the tools is, oh, my gosh, I'm not wrong. Uh, There are actually other people that function like me. And that was such a gift to get out of the wrongness. So I'm wondering how many adults that are on this school and listening in the future can, um, you know, um, on this about kids, yet they are really yeah. connecting, can connect as, as yeah. next to yeah. themselves. Uh-huh. So great. I just want to remind people that if you have noise around you, behind you, to please mute yourself. I'll um, do my best to control that as well, just to have the best recording. But I also wanted to welcome everyone to the APS school, we call it the Access Possibility School, in this um, Possibilities School. And we wanted to, you know, inviting Diva to this platform to come and speak to, um, you know, people that are already within the school or that are working with kids and parents. And as you were talking, Christina, yes, as adults, I'm I'm also really aware in my own world of where I first heard these um, different elements in access that I started to go, wow, is it possible that I'm slightly autistic or slight, you know, all these, all these labels that I'd had heard that I'd be like, no way, I'm not that. So given that we're working, many of us on the call today are working with kids. Um, one, I'm wondering what questions people have that they may want to ask you, but is there, you know, what is it about, working with kids that we can be aware of that might create more ease in, you know, like what tools can we give them to create more ease in their world? Yeah. And thank you for saying that. Cause you know, it is, it's, this is a huge topic, obviously, like it's yeah. a huge topic <laughs> and um, it's, it's one of the specialty classes in access. So, you know, we go into this in a lot of detail, but one of the main things that um, I would love to say is just that, this information applies in so many more areas than perhaps we've been aware of. Um, I mean, there are people that I know that I, that I grew up with that were labeled. And of course, you know, they had um, perhaps different treatment in school. They had different classes, different things that actually dress up. But there were also a ton of kids that weren't labeled because they didn't fit into um, exactly what the label of that disability was, but they still had perhaps difficulties in certain area or certain areas, or perhaps they, you know, uh, remembered information in a different way, you know, so all these different things, I think now, nowadays, we're actually having so much more access, obviously, to the internet, and to this global information, we're realizing that actually, there are so many kids and adults out there that have these amazing capacities that you know, perhaps just haven't even know that that that's what they are. So one of the main things that I um, always start with is just one of the most foundational access tools, which is to ask a question. And it sounds so simple that everyone usually is like, oh, great, okay, next, you know. But actually, whenever you're asking a question, what you're doing is you're willing to let go of that fixed point of view that you may have of what that situation is. And so much of what we do when we actually label kids, whether it's officially diagnosed or not you know you can just label somebody as being really hyper or always being really noisy or the troublemaker in the class you know even those are labels but whenever we go into question what we're doing is we're actually willing to look from a different perspective that makes not only their life easier but ours as well um and one of the questions that I remember asking a lot actually in the school um, when I was teaching, there was in particular this one little kid who was so bright, but he was actually so fast that he would finish everything really quickly and then start just being hyper and annoying everyone. Um, (laughs) So I would always ask him, okay, so if you could 
choose anything right now, like what would you choose? Like, what do you know? Like, what do you know that you could add to this? What do you know that would make this even greater? What do you know that you could add to, you know, if we were doing exercises, I remember we did quite a bit on Harry Potter. I was slightly obsessed with that for a while, or maybe <laughs> still am, um, you know, and he, you know, the kids would love that. And then they would finish their exercise, but there'd be, you know, more that they could do. So I was always asking him, like, what do you know? Like, what would you like to explore? Because one of the things that I've, um, you know, and I'm sure that you guys as teachers of, at APS will know is that when you speak to these um, kids and even adults that are excellent, when you speak with them about a topic that they're engaged in and that they actually enjoy, you can pretty much take it anywhere. But you have to find what that is and you have to ask them what it is that they know. Because as soon as you ask them what they know, then they're able to explore their knowing and realize that they actually have a capacity in that area and that they don't necessarily need to rely on anybody else telling them who they are, what they're capable of. Um, so it's kind of a loaded answer because I could have gone in 50 million directions there, but definitely start with asking a question and asking, what do you know here? Do you know, I have a quick question. Um, when you have, hi, when you have um, kids that are on the spectrum that are maybe less verbal or <laughs> would rather put the answer in other people's heads, what are your suggest some suggestions as a teacher knowing that like yes I'm able to hear that their answers in their head or get that it's they're doing it for somebody else and I'm also aware that when they move on from my classroom or when they are out in the, out in the quote unquote real world you know getting a job or that other people might not function like that what tools could I give them to make it a little bit easier and get them to, you know, see that maybe this might not work with everybody. I love this question. Um, and it's, oh, I just love this question so much because actually it relates even so much to the way that I used to function. I mean, I remember having conversations <laughs> with Simone, who's the worldwide coordinator of access, where she'd be like, honey, you do realize you never said that out loud. And I was like, no, no, no I said it. <laughs> and she was like, no, no, like, you know, and so she's, she actually started to really invite me to look at the places where I was just saying things in my head. And I, honest to God, did not realize that they were not coming out of my mouth. Like, <laughs> genuinely did not get that at all. So I think part of this is actually educating the kids and saying to them, hey, you know what? I get that you communicate in a way that's a little bit different. I get that your mind is super fast and I get that you're not always using words because they're a little bit slow or for whatever reason. However, <laughs> not everyone's as fast as you. And you know, what could you say? What could you say out loud in words that people require to hear? And that's something that I often even ask myself still, you know, cause this is like a muscle. This is some, these tools, it's not like you use them once and then the problem is fixed. You now are an amazing communicator. It's not, you know, it's, it's actually, these are tools for creating a greater, um, you know, sense of living and enjoyment out of life and actually being able to function within a world that is filled with, you know, perhaps different boxes that we try and fit into while not bending yourself to fit into that box. So, I mean, I remember I've had a couple of kids that have attended the X-Men classes. And one of the things that I always say to the parents is, you know what, at Access, <clears throat> sorry and access we don't have the point of view that there is actually anything to fix like what if there is no problem here um and i know someone that your question isn't from that point of view but i do just want to address that because i think so often we go into like oh god now this is another thing that i've got to overcome what if in the future this becomes a problem you know i wonder how many of those things we're actually creating with our point of view before they've even become problems and um, so I think number one is just to recognize what if it's not a problem? What if the child is actually just missing information? I mean, with several of the kids that have come to the classes, they'll sit there and, you know, um, we'll be going through the class. I give them a few tools like, okay, what does the teacher require to hear here? What information are they looking for? Because these don't need to be questions that you're asking out loud. But the moment that you start asking them, you start remembering, oh, yeah, I remember that the teacher said make sure to include this in your paper you know but suddenly you're actually opening yourself up to that whether it's a memory whether it's just information that you're downloading whatever that is so i would encourage them to ask questions but also let them know like hey is it possible that you communicate a little bit different to people do you ever think something at someone like don't come near me stay away from me 
and then you get really annoyed when they're coming near you only you've never said it out loud you know <laughs> so just getting them to recognize because it's actually so liberating when you acknowledge what is true for you and that's when you can begin to create a change but until you're willing to look at what is and acknowledge what is true and what is really going on it's really really difficult to choose something different you know, can we just take a step back and for those people that haven't done any access and what do you mean by putting people thoughts in people's heads like how does that all work um well um i didn't exactly say putting thoughts in people's heads but what i did say was just thinking at people like we've all done it you know we're all um you know how many times are we like oh god you know like please don't come and sit next to me on the bus. Like, please just don't sit next to me on the bus. And then the person sits next to you and you're like, I just told you not to sit next to me, you know? <laughs> but we're kind of thinking these things at people or we're thinking like, okay, don't say what you're about to say. Don't say what you're about to say. And we're thinking it, but we never say it out loud. So how much communication actually gets lost because we're doing it up here or we may be doing it energetically just with this vibe of, please let me be the one that answers the question in class because I know the answer, but I'm too scared to put my hand up. Or please don't pick me to be on the netball team or whatever that is. And we're putting out these like the huge vibes of information, but we're actually not always communicating in the way that the other people require to receive the communication. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so that's a lot of what I find um, a lot of the X-Men doing because to them it's just, natural why wouldn't everybody hear what's going on in their heads and I I mean I've worked with you guys a lot and I'll often say oh sorry the part that I missed that was in my head was ABC I already jumped to DEF <laughs> so it's actually just recognizing and maybe sometimes when um, a child that you're working with isn't making sense or it seems like they're jumping around stop them and go hey okay so what information are you giving me that you didn't say in words or that I'm not getting? Like, can you just jump back? Like, let's just imagine for a second that my brain isn't as fast as yours, you know, and kind of make it funny and lighthearted. Um, Cause then you're also acknowledging them, you know, you're acknowledging that they do have a capacity. It's not that they don't know just cause someone isn't talking with their mouth does not mean that they're not speaking, you know, and this is very, very true for um, kids with autism that are nonverbal. They are communicating in dynamic ways. Let me tell you, um, so it's really about asking them questions that get them to recognize, oh, maybe I didn't actually communicate this. Maybe this, you know, she requires more information. <laughs> I love it. The piece about, we're, yeah, to acknowledge them that we may be a lot slower than them. That's, yeah. There's a parent that just uh, made a comment in the chat and she says, if I as a parent have been labeling my kids up until this moment, what can I do now? Should I talk to them, apologize? What do you recommend for parents that are becoming aware of them labeling? Yeah, I would say the first thing, um, I mean, the first thing that comes up for a lot of parents that um, come to these classes is that they are really, um, they can be a bit hard on themselves for not being the most perfect parent on the planet. Um, <laughs> um, so first of all, I would say the moment that you can actually choose to not judge you, that is the moment when actually your kids can start to have more freedom as well, more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, kids generally are not going to sit there and be resentful. You know, if you go, you know what, I'm really sorry. I actually was, you know, wrong here. You're, you're right. Like, what do you know here that I'm not aware of? They'll instantly be so grateful. You know, you'll find that they'll forget about it within 10 seconds. So I'd say a lot of it has to come from you actually being willing to go, okay, so if I wasn't wrong here, what possibilities would I have available? Like if I wasn't judging me, what would be the gift in this? Because mm. it's like, I truly believe, you know, like everything that we choose gets us to where we are. So how much of that labeling and kind of looking at what could be fixed, how much of you choosing that has been so that you can get to the space where you go, you know what? No, that doesn't work anymore. And that's never going to work. And so then from that space onwards, you're always choosing a different possibility. So what if really you as parents and even as teachers and all of us that are interacting with kids or with X-Men on every level, whether we know it or not, what if we're actually doing the best that we can with the tools that we've had thus far and what else can we choose now um, having access to these amazing access tools? Great. I know there was another question that came in. Um, and I think, is there anyone on our group here that would like to open up their mic and ask a question directly? 
there's I know there is a question about um, dealing with a student that had fetal alcohol syndrome. That was the one. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that was that was um. I actually contacted that one. Oh. That question was addressed more in um in the class in private session. I would really do that in in this kind of setting because one of the things that we do with that across all the access consciousness work is that yes. Oops. Hold on, uh, I'm someone's coming in from a phone that I'm trying to locate. If you just came in and on a phone line, can you please mute yourself? And I got it. That wasn't the one. Let's see. So what I was looking at was that, um, yeah. With all of this work, one of the key things is to really look at every single person as an individual because it's so easy to go, oh, you have this label, so blah, 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 that means A, B, and C. You have been labeled with this and you've had it for four years. Oh, no, that must mean X, Y, and Z. You know, what if that is not actually true? What if every single person has their own experience of what's going on and their own situation? And the way that you actually get to access that information and get to start to facilitate some change in the area is by asking that person questions, um, which is why I did say to the lady, I was like, hey, I'll send you a private message because, you know, it's something that we would look at in a lot more detail. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I really, really love about this work and the access consciousness tools as well, that it really does look at each individual um, and it asks them questions because what if we actually... It's like me as a facilitator, I can't really know what's going on for anyone. Only they can, which is why we ask the questions, because they actually empower you to get to your own awareness. And that to me is so, so key for kids as well, because how many of us were asked questions when we were kids? <clears throat> you know, how many of us were invited to know that we had any level of awareness? I mean, I am incredibly lucky because my parents always ask me questions about everything, whether they were moving house, whether they were thinking about buying the house that they were renting, whether it was what kind of dinner we were going to have, whether they thought um, that, you know, we should take my brother out of tennis class, whatever it was, they always asked me, hey, Diva, like, what do you reckon? But genuinely, they weren't being sarcastic. They genuinely wanted to hear my point of view. So I was very, very lucky growing up having a sense that my point of view, my awareness had value. And that's where asking the question is so key, particularly if you're going to um, deal with you know, um, you know, these kinds of uh, interactions and, and disabilities one-on-one -on -one outside of a classroom setting as well to see what's actually going on for that child. The, the piece you talked about, um, about the, the wrongness, getting out of the wrongness of, of kids, and, um, and it brought up for me how as a teacher I had these tools. I always believed I had to be right. Um, in everyone's eyes and I had to be in control and that wasn't working very well and it did change with the tools of access so could you talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I mean it's just gosh <laughs> like <clears throat> how do I talk about this without just gushing about access um, you know, so <laughs> yeah I mean this is something that I think really just applies across the board whether you're a parent whether you're a teacher whether you know, you are just, and whether you're an employee, whether you're a boss, whatever it is, how often are we taught that we have to be right, we have to have the answer? Um, a lot of X-Men that I know are perfectionists to a degree that is unreal. So one of the main ways to actually start to address that, as you said, um, is actually, Christine, by going into, okay, so if you weren't judging you, what would you be aware of here? Um, that's a question that I ask a lot, you know, like if you weren't wrong, what would be right about this? What would be the capacity? Because I think so often it's very easy to go into that entrained point of view of instantaneously judge yourself as wrong. Instantaneously, you must be missing information. Instantaneously, you must not be good enough. That's what we're taught. That's very easy. That's just us kind of following the way that it's supposed to be. But what if there's something different available, truly? You know, what if it's not always the heaviest and most solid thing that you then have to kind of like, you know, deconstruct and go around this huge solid rock? What if it's actually the lightest thing that makes you go, oh, like, I wonder what that is? That gives you that sense of kind of, 
lightness, expansion. What if that is the energy that is going to start to create change? Because if you keep on doing the same thing and you keep on judging yourself as though that's going to motivate you to do better according to your own judgments of yourself that you will do better and on and on it goes round and round and round. What if actually what's required is a completely different point of view? So you could also start by asking what different point of view could I have here that would create a change? And, and the piece about asking the questions there, Diva, I also get that, you know, we are taught at a really young age to find the answer, but it really is the sense of asking the question to kind of receive more information. Can you speak a little more about mm. these questions that you're inviting us all to ask? Mm, absolutely. And I mean, this is something that I, I see with kids so much um, is, I mean, if I just, okay, I'm like, how many things can I have in my head? So if you look at having the answer, what do you have to have before you have the answer? You have to know the answer. So to look for something that you have to know kind of is like this weird conflictual reality because unless you know it, how are you supposed to know it? And by knowing it or by having the answer, it has to be something that you've been taught, that you've read, that you've learned because your mind can only actually give you information that it already knows. It's just a memory bank. Um, Whereas when you actually start going into, okay, if I didn't have to have the answer here, what would I know? Like a question that I ask um, X-Men a lot is, if you weren't thinking, what would you know? If you weren't feeling, <laughs> what would you know? If you weren't having an emotion about this, what would you know? Just what would you know? Can't be right, can't be wrong, because there's no right or wrong answer. You know? But really looking at that, because if you look at it, what is faster, thinking or knowing? Knowing. That's the lighter one somehow. It makes no logical sense. But this is something that you see in kids where they are able to pick something up within an instant and then run with it and extrapolate it. Or when, um, you know, I mean, I remember being at school and given like several months to do a math. Um, they used to call it coursework. It's like the big project at the end of the year. And I, within like five minutes, would have the final answer, but I had no idea how I got there. I couldn't work it out, you know. And so we have these kids that are doing these different things, and then we're going, well, you didn't do it my way, so you're actually wrong, rather than asking, okay, that is really cool. Somehow you managed to get there. What do you know? Like, obviously you weren't thinking to get there because thinking is a lot slower. It would have taken you months, like the project <laughs> dictated. So what do you know? Like, what information did you have access to? Like, and start to play with that with them. Um, but that really is when it becomes an exploration as to what it is that they're capable of, which really does begin to give them the tools um, to go on in life knowing, like I said before, that they have a level of awareness that they can actually use to create their life as they would like to and not necessarily have to follow what other people are telling them they should and shouldn't do and be and shouldn't be. <laughs> and, with, and with that, Diva, we have someone else um, along the same line that's asking, how can medication obscure the knowing of the child and the ability to receive information and what yeah. can contribute when a student is medicated? Yeah. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, I was just speaking with somebody the other day who um, their child was diagnosed with probably 10 different things and they had this long list of medication. And she was saying, I'm not going to give my child this, you know, and that's a choice. So I'm really not saying don't medicate your child, you know, and I'm also not saying do medicate your child. I think this is something that, again, has to be um, looked at on an individual basis. But like with any type of drug, how much of you do you have access to when you are taking that drug? And how much of those drugs are designed to actually take you out of being you into this controlled thing <laughs> that, you know, everybody can then mold or whatever. Um, you know, so it's kind of a huge topic. Um, and again, it's something that is addressed in, in the X-Men classes and in a lot of the different access classes, not just X-Men. Um, but as with any drug, I would say it does definitely alter that. Um, there are other, I mean, there's so many tools, there's so many questions. Um, one of the things that I really look at a lot with X-Men kids is asking them the question, who are you being right now? Because they have this huge capacity for awareness. And by awareness, I mean, if 
something to you is as loud as a little bird to them it might be as loud as a dinosaur so everything to them is exponentialized their sensorial capacity is exponentialized and not just with the five senses that we're aware of but with what they can perceive in terms of their zone of awareness which you even see in wildlife and you see that in nature you know even <clears throat> animals have that they have this zone of awareness we've all had the experience where we can feel someone coming into the room without turning around or even hearing them so those kinds of things are things that i'm talking about and when you have that level of awareness it can be so easy to sit next to somebody and suddenly be really grumpy when you weren't grumpy before so is that actually you being grumpy or is that your level of awareness of the person next to you? Now, when you have a more linear way of functioning, you might be able to deduce that after a while. But when you're a child and there's so much information all over the place, it can get a little intense. So you might want to start asking kids, who are you being right now? When they are behaving in a way that is actually not congruent with who they are or, or what it is that they're desiring to create. Because what that does is it gives them this, the, um, the sense and the perception of, oh, that's true. I'm just behaving like my best friend because I thought that he was cool. Or my dad's always really moody and he seems to get what he wants. So I thought I'd do the same thing, you know, so <laughs> I know that one too well, you know, but so those were questions that even when um, Gary, I remember asking me them several times, the founder of Rags, I was like, who are you being? Like with regards to this and with regards to that. And the more you ask that, the more you realize that so much of the behavior that we have is actually either learned or maybe we did it once when we were a kid and it got us a great result. We managed to get the ice cream that we wanted by having a tantrum um, or doing doing or screaming you know and so we're like great I'm gonna use that one for the future rather than looking at like okay what is what is it that I'm actually capable of <laughs> and what if I don't have to kind of like um you know be at the effect of all of the stimulus around me but rather actually have choice and have a real sense of myself wherever I am in whatever situation which I'm sure you guys know is something that is um quite a big topic for x-men kids so there's also um, another question that came in about kind of in that along that line as well. And it says, my child goes to a traditional school and he has been told um, that he is hyperactive. How can I deal with the situation without uh, making my child feel wrong? What suggestions do you have? Yes. <laughs> um, I just laugh because it just reminds me of me and certain people that I know. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things with, um, you know, being hyperactive that I always say to kids and even to their parents is if we weren't in a society where you're told that the more still and composed you are, the more well behaved you are. But if you were just, if you were just living in a world where you might want to have a little bit of energy, would it be a good thing or would it be a terrible thing? It would probably be a great thing that you have so much energy available to you. Now, the thing is that when you have somebody that has so much energy available to them and then you're telling them to be really, really still, what's that going to do? That's going to make them have even more energy and go crazy because they've got nothing to do with it and nowhere to put that. Um, so I would, first of all, even ask the kid, okay, how much more energy do you have available than most of the people around you? Just to get them to acknowledge that, number one. Because often they'll, they'll be like, oh my God, I'm, there's something wrong with me or whatever. I mean, I remember even as an adult, people saying to me, you need to take sleeping pills, sleeping three hours a day is not enough. You're going like, to die soon. I'd be like, oh my God, I need pills. You know, and really, I just had so much more energy. You know, So really looking at like, what is the ability and what is the capacity behind this and if you do have somebody who is so hyper and has so much energy, what we're often taught is that the more you can get them to calm down, the easier their life will be. If they can just focus on one or two things, they will be able to deliver those things. My question is, how often does that actually work? It doesn't ever really work, at least not for the long term. So unless we want to be insane and keep on doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, we might want to try something different, which would be to, um, in this society and reality's terms, to overstimulate, which actually is just adding a lot more things going on so that you can actually start to nurture that level of energy that they have rather than try and like squash it in. So if you do have a child who's um, hyperactive or even who can't do their homework and is just like, I mean, I remember I would never do my homework until the very last minute when I had about literally four minutes to do it all that was kind of enough energy for me to go okay I'll just do it really quickly but if I had to sit down in a quiet environment and do it it would take me about four hours because all I could do was think about every other thing that existed on the planet rather than that homework so what you want to do is have 
an iPad, a TV going, a radio going, as much stimulus that would usually annoy someone to the point of like explosion is probably what they require to have a sense kind of, of um, just of more calm where they're like, oh great, everything is kind of like energetic like me. Cool, okay, I can do this in five minutes. And you'll find that they'll be able to do their homework or maybe even if it's you, you might be able to do your projects or work on your business a lot easier. Um, so yeah. That's so funny. I just found myself at a coffee shop yesterday. I had a lot of projects to do and, and someone said, oh my gosh, this must be an insane place to try to do you know, homework, they've called it. And I thought, actually it creates a lot of ease in my world. So it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've often said to people, like, if you are in a room and you have four people screaming at you, right, just get that, okay, pretty intense. And then if you are in a football stadium and you have 50,000 people screaming, in which situation is it easier for you to have a sense of yourself? The one where there's a lot more going on. Why? Because that doesn't become so loud. It actually becomes kind of like a background noise and you go, oh, cool, I'm here and there's all these crazy people screaming. Rather than each thing being so loud in your face that you're like, ah, what do you want from me? Where am I supposed to go? You know? So that's kind of how um, actually flipping these things <laughs> and looking at them from the other side can often create a lot of these. Awesome. There's another question here that came in. My daughter um, is very psychic. She got that uh, she got people information easily or she gets people's information easily. Is this why she has panic attacks? Um, it could be. It could be. I mean, uh, panic attacks are often a result of so much information and just, um, I mean, people call it being really sensitive. Um, I don't really like using that word because it implies that there's something wrong with you that you need to get over, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Um, but I would say being hyper aware or mega aware. Um, so yeah, it can be. And a great tool to ask is what are you perceiving that you're not acknowledging? What are you aware of right now? Um, because it's only when we don't acknowledge our capacities that we end up being at the effect of them. And that's actually, I heard Dr. Dane here, who's a quick creator, right? so say that once and I nearly fell over. I was like, oh my God, that is so true. So yeah. Those would be two questions to ask. What are you perceiving? And that's really, really what you want to ask with a lot of these kids, even when they are, when they suddenly start to have tantrums or even when they're having a lot of symptoms that, um, you know, like with OCD and stuff, um, like repetitive behaviors or things that are kind of like harming to themselves. You want to ask them, what are you perceiving? What are you aware of? Um, because more often than not, they're actually going to be aware of things around them. It could be that they're very aware of somebody's mood and they don't know what to do with that, you know? So, um, if you're willing to really start to look outside of the box, even if it seems completely illogical, that may be where a lot of these uh, different choices are available because clearly they're not available in the logical universe. Otherwise, we would have a very different planet right now. <laughs> I think that's such a, a big piece um, of not calling yourself sensitive because I've worked with a man who kept using that term. I'm, I'm, I've always been sensitive. And when I asked him, is it sensitive or are you very aware? He told me later that that completely changed his world. It just took him out of the wrongness of him into the awareness of the strongness of him. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I've worked with several people too, just like you, Christine, where, you know, you're told you're sensitive, but it's always with an underlying little bit of judgment of, Can you get over it already? Like, you really have to be so sensitive, you know, or whatever. But it's kind of implied that it's a wrongness. Like, it's probably not a great thing to be. Um, so instantly you're trying to fix a problem. But if there's no problem to fix and it's just a level of awareness, how are you ever going to get out of that? Right. You're not. Because you're trying to clean a window that isn't even dirty. You just can't see outside because there's fog outside. And the fog is always going to be, you know. <laughs> I love your analogies. <laughs> and we have a question from Savia. Yes. Yes. Hi, Diva. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank right. I, um, I just had an awareness because um, obviously having these X Men capacities, it was masked by the fact that even though I was born in London and brought up in England, English isn't my first language, and I've become because I'm working at a school uh, with kids whose English isn't their first language. And it's like trying to get I'm a bit stuck on how to get the information without being arrogant to the teachers. Because I've obviously been a teacher and I'm working in these capacities. It's like, 
because they always use the excuse, well, you know, their they're, English isn't the first language. And I'm like, it's more than that. And I'm, what could I be and do to... Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, um, actually, I'm really grateful that you asked that because this I've seen this a lot with actually X Men adults, and I think actually in some ways I'm kind of like adults, kids, yeah. or are we all infinite bod- uh, infinite beings in just different bodies? You know. So the first thing that I would say is really kind of addressing that just as a little precursor before I start to address your question, Sophia, is really actually speaking with these kids on a level where you're actually acknowledging them as a being. You're not like, you know, little two-year-old, you know. It's more like, okay, hey, what's going on for you? And actually addressing that huge being that is there, that's actually what's going to start to create change. I mean, if you think back to when you were six or seven or 10, did you feel like a little pathetic dweeb? Or or were you like, hey, this is me, I'm a real person, you know? And that's how these kids feel too, because guess what? They are real people, they're not just little things. So that was one. Okay. Your question, Sophia, is that actually I've seen this in a lot of adults um, that I've worked with, where actually they, whether it's their first language or not, when they communicate, stuff comes out in a really jumbled way or they don't really get to be succinct. I used to do this a lot myself. Yeah, I do that. This, again, is something that we address in quite a lot of detail in the class. I'm not trying to plug the classes at all. Yeah that you guys can access and you know um you can have that information but one thing that i will say is when you start to ask like one question that i always ask myself is how succinct can i be here what information can these people receive and in what order does this need to come out and just ask that and just allow it to come out because one of the things with um people that are x-men is that we're told that that we have like a left brain and a right brain function Mm. Actually, people that are X-Men, they function more from a whole brain function. What does that mean? It means that there's no separation between the logical and the creative and intuitive. So yeah. what happens is that information tends to get kind of like, do this, everything yeah. is there. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah that's, that's me, yeah. <laughs> it sounded a lot better in my head. You know, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to ask. Okay, so how can I deliver this in a way that people can receive it? And just ask yourself that every day, like, you know, what can I be today that will allow me to be more succinct than I've ever been before and play with the questions. You know, you can't get them wrong, but play with them and see how you can start to have more ease in that. So that would be the first step I would say. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. for. I have been using the tools that you've given me and I'm Mm -hmm. grateful for them. Thank you. Thank you. you. And here's another um, question here that came in says, yes, my eldest daughter solves her math in school when listening to music. She says it's so easy then. And I think that's a huge piece. And I'm wondering, you know, even in the classroom, you know, what can we invite teachers to become aware of that might, you know, creating a different space for some of those kids that are having challenges staying focused? I think that's an issue that oftentimes is like, he doesn't focus. He's so distracted. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you just touched on something really um, important, Sylvia, which is, you know, I think so often we're looking at like, how do we change the whole system? And I think that's great because that definitely should be our target. And I have to say, it's going to start with you because as soon as you start creating those changes, I know that sounds really cheesy, like the change starts with you, you know, but it's really like as soon as you start creating those changes and people see, oh, that child is suddenly delivering. Maybe they're not focusing on one thing. Maybe they have five projects in front of them and they're doing three minutes, two minutes, one minute, five minutes, 20 minutes, and they're jumping around, but they're focusing for 60 seconds, <laughs> good enough for me, you know, but as soon as you start to actually implement these things in your classes, in your home life, even with yourself, even at work, even with staff members, you know, just start noticing how different people receive information differently, how they perceive the world differently, the more people are going to start to take notice and go, well, actually, that's giving results that nothing else has. I mean, I can sit here and talk to everyone about how amazing X-Men and the access tools are, um, but it's not until I say to people, oh my God, this kid that was failing at school and was about to be taken down yet another year, so two years, after the X-Men class convinced his teachers to let him take the exams and he got the highest out of everyone just by using the access tools and the X-Men tools in the exam and now he's like flying. And this actually occurred, but when I say that people go, what? That can actually do that, you know? And so I would say, like, the more that you are willing to get out there and actually play with these tools in a way that isn't significant like this is the way that we should all do it, like, because then we're just giving people the same but different. We're trying to be the answer. Um, I think the more that 
we can all kind of step out there and be willing to be leaders in this area and actually just run with what we know and see what change gets created. That's when everyone will start noticing. And that's where we can actually start to really, really empower other people to know that they can also facilitate that change. Great. Um, here's another one. That I work with visual intelligent people of all ages, mostly highly gifted and highly sensitive. When they meet me, I seem to be the first person who is asking them what they think is, quote unquote, the problem. And then you meet their awareness, which is great. So someone just really acknowledging, yeah, that this does. And, and I get that piece that it is such a gift to the kids. And I've gotten to see that through APS. That has been something that we are doing different. And we've seen kids change quickly. We have lots of stories that are coming out um, through our newsletter and, and other ways we're sharing it of the gift when you are acknowledging the child and giving them the space to ask and letting us know what works and doesn't work for them. Because that's effectively a longer term plan. Yeah. I mean, if we're just sitting there trying to give people answers and going, come on, just regurgitate it so we can get through the exam, will you already? <laughs> Rather than going, okay, there's this, you're actually creating leaders moving forward. You're creating adults that have a real sense of themselves, whatever that's going to be, whether they're going to be a gardener because they love being out in nature, whether they're going to be a teacher themselves, you're actually creating for a different future. And that's really what I see these access tools um, designed for, to actually create a different future, not just a different next five minutes, although that's great too, but it's like how do we empower these kids so that they can have that going on um, for them and they have those tools available for themselves as they move on in their lives. Great. And here's another piece. Um, it would be so great to have this possibility online in many languages to create meetings for teachers all over the planet. Are you ready? What would it take? And oh, yes, we would need to be more people out there that can spread it. Just saying, Diva. <laughs> I like it. I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> Um, and with that said, I, I mean, if anybody else has a question, you can do it through uh, the chat or also out loud. But Diva, I know that you, you know, you mentioned a couple classes and we still have another 15 minutes. But, you know, I would like you at some point to let us know, you know, if we want more information or to dive um, more into some of these areas. Where can they find you? What classes are coming up? What is available for people? Sure. Um, so we have a great new website um, that we are adding more information to every day. It's xmenabilities.com, just all one word, xmenabilities.com. Um, and in there you have a ton of resources. You have a schedule of all the upcoming classes. We do have stuff that's online as well. And we are putting products on there, which are past telecalls that people can purchase and have access to. And, you know, if you guys have ideas of things that you'd like, please email us, you know, like you, there's a contact form on the website too. So just say, hey, can we have a course for our teachers or for whatever, you know. Um, and APS is really amazing for that too. So I'd say those would be two places, accessmarkabilityschool.com and xmenabilities.com. Okay, here's a question. Do X-Men kids have a unique way of learning? <clears throat> would they benefit from academic support? Maybe we can, um, you know, so... I guess it, maybe it's a question more for us through APS in the sense of, you know, one of the things we do offer is tutoring um, and really done different. I think one of the things when I've worked with parents, it was the sense of, you know, it's not going to be more the same, like that sense of, wow, where can we approach things and the child different that might actually create more ease. Um, so that was just a little point for APS tutoring. So, yeah, visit the website, accesspossibilitieschool.com. And I have found that through working with kids in tutoring that um, it's not this ongoing tutoring, 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 but giving to kids tools that can create the change that gives them more ease in school. And one of the biggest pieces that changed things for kids was just having them acknowledge um, their talents and abilities. I had kids who were having real difficulty in school and, and they these boys could take apart um, and put back together a motorcycle and no one ever acknowledged that that was a capacity that that was a talent and just looking at things that aren't in the box of school that they have talents in 
just opened up a whole new world for them that actually changed how they were doing in school. So it's not always related to the academic portion, the school portion that you even have to work with. It's all these other things, this, you know, acknowledging them and getting them to see the, the strongness and the beauty in them. I love that you're saying that, Christine, because that's so much of that is, you know, looking again at like creating that future where you're not just looking at how somebody receives information or sees the world in one area, but you're looking at the bigger picture of the person. And I think sometimes we can forget that because we also are focusing on this subject, this homework, you know, or whatever that can be, but actually looking and going, okay, how does this person see the world? Apparently they are able to see how it's constructed and they can deconstruct it and reconstruct it in a second. Okay. Now, how do you apply that to different areas? So I love that. That's awesome. And, and can you talk about, um, I know, um, as a teacher, I would every year we'd have meetings at the beginning of the year and all this information would be given to us about kids you know, their labels, their home life, the, you know, how they have performed in the past. And I know I never really bought that as true and real, but could you talk about how that information can, um, can kind of put a limitation on working with a kid and what you can do to, to get out of that limitation? Absolutely. And, oh gosh, yeah, that is just a great question. <laughs> I'm so excited by everything. Um, basically, like one of the things that I see in people in general, regardless of the age, is that whenever you're looking to the past or what was yesterday, it's so difficult to move forward because you cannot even see what's occurring today. And I get that that may seem a little woo-woo or whatever, but even if you look at it from a practical sense, if you've decided that these kids are having uh, you know, problems at home, which, for example, I know several of my teachers decided, and um, I remember teachers uh, assuming that I was like this rebel child that was like smoking and doing all this crazy stuff, which I never was. Like, I never. And they'd be like, Zodiva, how long have you been like hanging out behind the bike shed smoking? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? I wasn't even there. But because they had these points of view that I had this difficult home life, they instantly put me into that bracket. You know, so it was very difficult for them to see when stuff was changing or when my home life situation did change because nobody asked a question. So um, I would say, first of all, sure, receive that information because it's good information to have. You never know when it's required. You know, none of this is really about rejecting what's going on currently in the school system um, or rejecting everything that you've done thus far. It's actually about adding more information to it. So asking, okay, cool. So how much of this information is relevant? Like asking that to yourself, you know, and asking the kids like, Hey, how are things for you? Like get them to know a little bit as people like, what's going on for you? Like you happy, you sad, like what's up? You know, like getting just just so that they feel like they're seen a little bit sometimes, you know, um, I've done that before in classes when kids are just like not even listening and they're running right. And I'm like, hey, and they're like, "Uh oh, she's actually looking at me. She's not just going, hey, kids, be quiet, you know, and so it creates this different thing. So I wonder what it would be like if we were to actually um, not necessarily disregard that information, but go, OK, so I wonder what pieces of this information is relevant right now. Um, what is still applicable and, and be willing to, to know that stuff does change and kids change so fast. They really don't need uh, to hold on to stuff as long as we adults do. Um, so willing to acknowledge when stuff like that does change for them. And if their behavior changes, not just go, Oh, it's probably just a once off, but ask them, wow, that was awesome. Like what would it take for more of that to show up? How does it get any easier than that? Like, how was that for you? You know, and get them to acknowledge like, Oh yeah, actually, I could probably do that a lot more often. That seemed a lot easier than the other thing I was doing or whatever. Well, uh, yes, question? Can I have, ask a question? Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a, a 16 years old boy and uh, he is on the, uh, uh, his, uh, the grade job, to, uh, one more grade to the university. And uh, he is very, um, a lot of, uh, pressure on his academic school and he now going to school and drive us crazy and then he only went to school at uh, uh, two or three days a week and but he went to the tutor um uh, help her help him to get a grade so uh, my question is um 
uh, our school system in Hong Kong is not allowed, you know, uh, not go to school. But he told me that the teacher in the school doesn't help him. And the tutor really helped him. I think, I, I don't know how to, you know, dealing with this kind of, mm. you know. Well, yeah, and that's a great question because actually there are more and more kids that are going, hey, parents, guess what? This doesn't work. And we all know it's true. Yeah. And you guys are going, I know it's true, but somehow I don't know why we have to do this other thing. You know, so I think part of it is actually explaining to him and going, hey, honey, like I completely get that. Just know I'm with you. Like I've got your back here. I get that your teacher isn't helping you. I get that the tutor is helping you. However, if you don't go to school, I may end up in jail because that is <laughs> illegal, you know, and be willing to manipulate these kids. Like, because that's not like an evil, you're not like forcing them to do something bad, but give them information like, hey, I'm stuck in the middle here. I, I can't say to you, don't go to school because that is actually going to probably create A, B, C, D, E. Like, is that what you would really like? That's going to be really difficult. So would you be willing to actually go to school, you know, and, and just actually talk it out with them? Because I think a lot of the times, Again, we feel like we have to have an answer. Okay, go to school. No, don't go to school. You know, what if it isn't an either or universe? What if there's always something else available? And actually, you can include them in that too, um, mm -hmm. just by actually giving them more information. Like maybe he doesn't know actually what the consequences could be for you and the family if he doesn't go to school because he's just looking at like, hey, this makes sense for me. And you're like, yeah, it does. And there's a bigger picture that involves a lot more people you know so i think just giving um, kids information a lot of the time is one of the key things because we all assume that everybody knows what's going on in our head and they don't always you know so actually just like asking some questions and involving him might be the first step might not be the only step probably won't but you know <laughs> <stuff. laughs> yeah this is the first time i'm listening to you about x-men and uh, it feels like like my two kids are also x-men too <laughs> because they are very you know burnt. They communicate with brain. They, he do, doesn't need to uh, read a lot of book, and he tr actually he understands everything. He, you know, he he's so yeah. laid back, just uh, on the computer, you know, searching, and then he just know everything already. Yeah. yeah, they are. They're fast. They're smart. And then the next step is how do we invite them to actually use the system that we live in to their advantage. And to their advantage doesn't mean taking advantage of people in evil ways. It means actually how do you use it to create the life that you know is possible in a way that works for you and everyone else. So maybe it is going to school, knowing that it will create ease for your parents. Maybe it is not always reading your books, make, but making sure that you know the information. You know, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I didn't read one single book at university, but I did manage to get great grades, you know. So, like... Yeah. Was I doing what I was told? No, but I was doing what was required, you know? So asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's doing a good, a good, uh, good grade. Actually, he got 5A, 1B, 1C. Actually, he's doing good, but he's just not, uh, not like a normal kid, you know? Not no, normal. Not like kids. <laughs> yeah, you'd want to be normal for what reason? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for your question. So You're welcome, Karen. And Diva, <laughs> we're here at the end of our um, APS Hangout with you and so grateful what you've brought all of us, what, what it is that you know that you're sharing with us and inviting us to that really I get is creating a different future in homes and schools and out in the world. So, um, and thank you all for joining us. You will receive a recording of this Hangout and I would invite you to, you know, maybe if you haven't already, is to jot down some of those questions that Diva has invited us to ask and see what changes for you without looking at the answer. So Diva, is there anything else you'd like to say here just at the end for everyone? Just, um, just thank you so much to you guys and to APS um, and just to everyone willing to see this as a different possibility. I just don't even know. There's just so much, but I'm just so grateful and I'm so excited to get this out into the world for kids and for adults and for everyone and anyone because 
we all have so many capacities, like whether you're labeled, whether you're not labeled, like what would it be like to actually start to acknowledge our abilities and not always go to what is wrong with us? Um, like, is I really just wonder, is it time to start creating a different future where we are just really exploding into what is possible? Because um, that's what's required to create a different world. Thank you, Diva. Thank you so much. And someone's asking, what does it look like to contribute to the Access Possibility School? Share it with people. Explore. Invite your child to come participate in an extracurricular class if it's, you know, light for them. So we invite you to, um, yeah, check it out. If you have any questions, you can contact any of us teachers. We have our principal, Christine, Simone Pador, Adele King, and Maxwell is our director, and I am one of the teachers as well, Sylvia Puentes. So thank you all, and have a wonderful, wonderful day wherever you're at. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.